morning. To what? Am I the litter just today? Um, yes. Okay, nobody told me that. Yeah, I called and asked you about a month ago. Yeah, but you didn't give me a date. You didn't tell me what day I was okay, going to do it. Well, I'll check my emails. I have, sorry. It, it I doesn't I matter it. now. I, I'm going to do it, right? Okay, yes, please. Okay. okay I, and I'm just doing the welcome right now. Yeah, I, I don't have, I don't know what I'm reading. Okay. Um, There's some bulletins in the back. Wait just a minute until it comes from the next week. Let's let's figure out what he's doing. He's doing the liturgy. He's doing this part here called the worship. Yes, mm -hmm. led by Rob. So he does this, then the hymn, and then he leads this. I see his name is in this. So you can sit still for a little while until we get to uh, usually the assurance is done by you. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Um, it was so fun to see most of you last night, many of you and those who weren't there at the progressive dinner, we missed. It was a delicious and beautiful evening. Um, I also want to specifically welcome our guest pastor, who was our very first pastor when we organized, what is it now, 20, 20 years ago. Um, I always do it by Christopher's age. He's 27, so anyway, 23 or four years ago. It's been quite a while now. And uh, Gray was with us maybe 10 years? I mean, a little less. A little less than 10 years, anyway. Um, Gray was a beloved uh, first pastor, and um, we used to belovedly also say we had a twofer because his wife, Helen, um, led the most extraordinary children's programs for us. So, uh, so welcome, Gray. Welcome home. Thank you. Thank you. Nice. And um, the last thing I just would like to remind you is that this month is our last month for our Neighbors in Need collection. And Neighbors in Need is the um, fund at the national office, which I believe almost 75% of it goes towards indigenous people and programs here in the United States and the other 25% towards other kinds of justice programs. So. Obviously. They're going to do wage, wage equitability. Oh, yes, they're doing a lot around income yeah. and wage mm -hmm. um, in, <laughs> inequities that we have in our country. Mm -hmm. um, so, welcome. Stewardship? Are you? Yes, I am. Yeah, you're up. <laughs> Hello. Um, so my name is Phil Junda, and I was asked to talk a little bit about uh, my time here in church and what my thoughts were. And I started to think about um, church in general and what led me here. Um, I can remember as a kid being dragged to church every weekend, kicking and screaming. Um, we were raised um, Catholic and the, we went to this one parish that was right up the street from us in Sunday school in the basement on the metal chairs. Um, and it, every whenever we went on vacation, wherever we were, we would find a church to go to. Um, and I don't know, I, I, I liked going and I didn't like going. There were different reasons why. I would probably be a little bored staring at the sailing looking around, daydreaming. Um, then flash forward to being adult and I could make my own choices. And all of a sudden I realized I wasn't going to church anymore. And I remember um, we lived in Laconia and we had to get uh, my son baptized and I had to meet with the priest and we talked a little bit about it. 
And I got like really emotional and I was like really sad. And he talked to me about it. And I started thinking that maybe this was part of my life that was missing that I needed to, uh, to bring back. Um, so when we moved to Barnstead, um, I went on this voyage, I guess, to find a church for myself, one that I picked. Um, and I didn't worry about um, the, the titles of the church. I just decided to go. And it was kind of funny because it was a little bit about like um, Goldilocks. Um, I felt like I was Goldilocks. So the first church I went to was too big, too much. Um, there was like rock music when they sang and like people are dancing. And I was like, it was chairs, like padded chairs. And I was like, oh, okay, too much. Um, the next church I went to was too little. Um, there was a, like one or two people in there. They had like round tables with chairs and um, it just wasn't what I was looking for. Um, and then I found this church and it was actually just right. Um, it had, this church has a lot of the stuff I missed, um, the seating, the, some of the, some of the um, like rituals, um, but it has a lot of the stuff I did. It doesn't have a lot of the stuff I didn't miss. And that's what I think I love so much. And just in my short time here, um, I've met so many people. Uh, I felt so welcome. Um, I look forward to every Sunday. Um, my kids, I'm starting to drag them along. Um, <laughs> maybe a little kicking and screaming, but uh, hopefully I can win them over. Uh, so thank you for uh, accepting me here and um, giving me something to look forward to every Sunday. Thank you. the seas and continents. The Spirit of God calls on creation to dance and sing. All things conspire to give glory to God. All our days are temples in the Lift up your voices, O children. Raise your eyes to the beauty awakening among us. All things conspire to give glory to God. All our days are temples in the Blessed are the merciful and the meek and generous. Blessed are the weavers of justice and makers of peace. Blessed are singers of glory, the artisans of joy. Blessed are the truth tellers and the prophets of hope. Oh, I woke up this morning with my mind And I stayed on Jesus Woke up this morning with my mind And I stayed on Jesus Woke up this morning with my mind And I was stayed on Jesus Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Can't hate your neighbor in your mind If you keep it stayed on Jesus Can't hate your neighbor 
or in your mind if you keep it stain on jesus can't hate your neighbor in your mind if you keep it stain on jesus hallelujah 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 makes you love everybody with your mind when you keep it stain on jesus love everybody with your mind Love everybody with your mind. Yeah. Keep it straight, straight on Jesus. Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Please join me in the gathering prayer. O divine, become is a lifelong process. We evolve in the midst of ways being made narrow by fear and power. Help us to have the courage to listen to the truth of our lives, responding without resistance or need to control, but with welcome and curiosity. Guide us with your wisdom so that our becoming is an unfolding of our truest self. This lifelong labor cannot be carried out alone. So provide for us help from friends and lovers, family and creative companions to bear witness to what makes us come alive. Invoke in us your patience, grace, and imagination to the be who you have called us to do. And the call to confession. We approach God with our words of confession and with the deeds that prove our lives are changed. Gentle God, we bring before you our sinful selves and our need for reconciliation with others. We have done deeds we deeply regret. We have spoken words that have hurt others. We have trapped ourselves in false expectations, and we have accepted transient goods to satisfy our deepest longings. We have failed to reach out our heart to others in need. We have been silent when our words could have made a difference. We have not believed in ourselves. Call us to salvation, God, and help us to be at peace with all your children. The God who challenges us it's also the God who encourages us. The God who confronts us is also the God who accepts us. Be assured that God is with us now, accepting, guiding, and forgiving. Thanks be to God. So we have the opportunity in this service to pass the peace of Christ to one another. And Christ's peace be with you. Hey guys. Peace. Hi, Emily. <laughs> peace. Well, very good to be with you this morning. Very, 
very good to be back in this church. Um, what do I say? It's like I, uh, every time I come, there are things that are different. I've never seen screens before. Um, it used to be, what do I say? If you, in this church, I know that all of you are used to it, but I'm still, even the way it was when I was here, I'm still a little bit in shock. Uh, at how nice it is and uh, what a great job people have done here uh, in making this church such an attractive place to be, uh, to congregate, and to worship. Um, and so thank you for your invitation. The scripture is a scripture that we all know. This is uh, uh, a scripture about Zacchaeus, Jesus Say again. How is this? Good, good. <laughs> Let me know about anything like that. Otherwise, I'll be clueless. <clears throat> um, this, this is a story of, uh, of Jesus and Zacchaeus and uh, Zacchaeus' conversion. We don't use that word a lot, but this is what happens in the story. And it's also a story about money. So, so this is Luke, Luke 19, 1 through 10. Jesus was going through Jericho, where a man named Zacchaeus lived. He was in charge of collecting taxes and were very rich. Jesus was headed his way, and Zacchaeus wanted to see what he was like. But Zacchaeus was a short man, and he couldn't see over the crowd. So he ran ahead, he got ahead of everybody, and then he climbed up into a sycamore tree. When Jesus got there, he looked up and said, Zacchaeus, hurry down. I want to stay with you today. I'm sure Zacchaeus was in shock. No one greeted him. Zacchaeus was not liked in this town. And so I'm sure that he was in shock because the most important person then ran to, wanted to be with him this day. So Zacchaeus hurried down and gladly welcomed Jesus. Everyone who saw this started grumbling. This man Zacchaeus is a sinner. And Jesus is going home to eat with him. So later that day, Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus stood up. This was after being with Jesus. And so Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, I will give half of my property to the poor. And I will now pay back four times as much to everyone I have cheated. Maybe you're aware that Part of, the, part of the taxpayer's job was to cheat. At least that's the way they saw it. And so it's like taxpayers have hurt a lot of people. So, so Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, I will give half of my property to the poor and I will now pay back four times as much to everyone I have ever cheated. Jesus said to Zacchaeus, today you and your family have been saved because you are a true son of Abraham. The son of man came to look for and to save people who are lost. So this is a conversion story, a story of a radical change and as Jesus said, he came for the people who were lost. So, uh, some of you know, and probably the rest of you know by now, now that I've said a few words, that I grew up in the South, in the Bible Belt in Central Virginia, at a time when people talk about salvation a lot. 
I don't hear people talking about that much in our time. I'm not around conservative Christians these days, but I get the impression that even they are not talking about the concept of salvation as much as they used to. But back in the past, it was a key issue. Particular people in conservative evangelical churches would wonder, they would wonder if people were saved. They would worry about if they were saved. They used language like, have you accepted Jesus as your personal savior? Have you had a, relig a religious experience resulting in your salvation? They would have big revivals encouraging people to come up to the front and make a profession of faith resulting in their salvation. People in mainline Christian churches kind of gradually pulled away from the term and settled for something like joining a church, being a member of a church. Part of salvation has always been calling on God to save us from some terrible thing. People in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, called on God to save them from their enemies. And of course, people look at salvation as being saved from eternal death into eternal life. So I didn't just wake up one morning and start wondering wondering about the subject of salvation out of the blue. I got into this subject wondering about money. I was concerned about money, property, and wealth, and what the Bible says about them. I'm concerned that what the Bible says about money is the opposite of what I live. I'm concerned that what I live is a lot more like what our culture says about money than what the Bible says about money. And for me, I believe that what our culture says about money, wealth, and possessions is the exact opposite of what the Bible says. The Bible is full of verses about money, and they're all radical. But just for stories, just for starters, the story we call the rich young ruler. Jesus tells him to go and sell all that he has and then to come and follow him. And the rich young ruler, not surprisingly, wasn't ready to go that route. And, and neither are we. But it seems that is precisely what Jesus and his disciples did. In the story about the widow's might, Jesus was praising the older woman who gave all that she had. Jesus was praised, Jesus made the observation that the other people putting in their offerings gave more than she did, but knew it wasn't a sacrifice for them as it was for her. They were given out, the others were given out of their surplus. In her case, she didn't have anything left. There is the scripture, if you have two coats, imagine having just two. Give one to someone who doesn't have any. If you have food, share it with someone else. In Luke, it says Jesus sent his disciples to tell about God's kingdom and to heal the sick. And he told them, it was, it's hard to imagine, but he said, don't take anything with you. Don't take a walking stick, a traveling bag, or food, or money, or even a change of clothes. What leader in their right mind would send his followers out on, the, on a mission with absolutely nothing? And then, of course, today's reading is about Zacchaeus and his struggles with money, wealth, and possessions. These are just a few of the many scriptures about money and wealth. There are a lot, and all of them are radical. 
So on one side, I was looking at all these parts of the Bible that were so radical and demanding about money. On the other side, I was discovering what horrendous things people throughout history have done to get wealth. I was naive about mass crimes committing out of, committed out of greed. I was shocked. One of the things that I learned about was colonialism. I didn't know much about colonialism. In college, I was a history major, but I still didn't know anything about colonialism. I think that the reason for that is that people don't want us to know how terrible it was. Even the word, even the word colonialism is a euphemism. The truthful term should be military occupation. In the past, when a country used its power, influence, and military to occupy a weaker country, instead of it being called a crime, it's called colonialism. When a more developed country uses its military to occupy a less developed country, the purpose was to steal its wealth. Colonialism is actually worse than a criminal walking into a store, robbing a store and killing someone. In that not only does the perpetrator country beat, rob, dominate and kill inhabitants of the occupied country, they continue it for, for decades. Instead of calling it a crime, the colonizing powers have celebrated their colonization of weaker countries. As I was saying this, it occurred to me that I don't know, I didn't know much about colonialism and, and, and maybe, maybe this is uh, something that you're not familiar with either. But at one time, most of the world was either a colony of a wealthier country, usually of European country. They were either, they either fell into the category of being a colony, all of Africa, um, and, uh, uh, and, and Latin America. And so there were, you were either one or the other. So many of us think of the Nazi Holocaust as a supreme example of evil on a national scale. And of course, it was totally dreadful, absolutely. However, what I didn't know is that there are other holocausts that have happened equal to or greater than that terrible crime that happened in Germany. We all know that, we all know that India was a colony of Great Britain. What we don't know is that colonization caused the death of approximately 30 million human beings during that time. Starting in 1876 through uh, around 1915, there were several years when the monsoons didn't come in, in not only in, it, you know, it, in, in India, but in other parts of the world. And so the crops didn't produce, there were about three there were about three times when the monsoons didn't come and it was extremely dry. And so during this, during these times, millions, millions died. There were horrible famines over this time period. But most of that suffering and death didn't have to happen. There were terrible droughts precipitating the hardship and there were food shortages. But the primary cause of the millions of death in India was not drought. It was how Britain used its power to control and manipulate India's economy that was lethal. There was plenty of wheat to give people subsistence diets. However, the British were shipping it out of the country as people were dying. 
they could get higher prices for the wheat in other parts of the world. So they shipped it out. Indian people were lying dead of starvation beside silos full of wheat. They were lying dead beside railroad cars filled with grain that was being shipped out of the country. You see the pictures on the internet and these people were skin and bones. Britain was going to get the highest price for the Indian grain, regardless that millions of human beings were starving to death. Put bluntly, Britain's goal as a colonial power was to enrich itself to the fullest extent possible, regardless of human cost. It was greed. Something like 30 million human beings died of starvation and disease during this time period. So moving to another country, sometimes I, I, did this, I did this sermon in another church and I feel like that I should give one of these TV announcements that say, that that say um, some of what you see may be disturbing. You may not want to listen or watch. That's what this is. Moving to another colony. This was roughly during the same time period, late 1800s. King Leopold II of Belgium bought the area, bought the part of Africa called the Congo. Imagine, one man owned this vast territory. Leopold's colony was larger than France, England, Germany, Italy, Spain combined. And he owned all that land, that's one man. It was 76 times the size of Belgium, the country he was king of, course, the king of, of course and almost one quarter the size of the United States. So Leopold now owned this, these vast lands and promptly made himself king sovereign of it all. It's hard to imagine the scope of the brutality, cruelty and depravity King Leopold's regime inflicted on the African people. The human cost was staggering. Rubber was just starting to be a valuable commodity. In order to harvest rubber, Leopold raised a European army and sent them to the Congo. They committed horrible atrocities, resulting in the deaths of approximately 10 million people. They made the Africans harvest the rubber. If they didn't harvest their quota, not only were they beaten horribly, the Europeans would cut off hands and feet of those who didn't bring in enough. Or they would cut off the hands and feet of their children. They would massacre a village to frighten another village into harvesting rubber. It's hard to imagine the horror these Europeans inflicted on the Africans in order to steal their rubber. I've been in shock since I started learning these things. I, I, found my, I found myself thinking about children that I knew and I couldn't imagine how people could cut off their hand or their foot. I, I couldn't absorb it. So shifting back to the biblical story of Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus is another example of a man who, who was captive to the love of money. He had hurt a lot of people through his cheating, through his extortion when collecting taxes. We don't know all the details, but through his extortion, he could have put some people into slavery. He could have caused people to lose their property and become beggars. He could have caused families to be split up. That was his life. And so Jesus calls to Zacchaeus and he comes scrambling out of the tree. Perhaps he glimpses the possibility of acceptance rather than rejection. 
Surely he is shocked to be invited to host Jesus instead of being called out as a cheating tax collector. Maybe instead of sensing judgment in Jesus, he can sense love. He intuits that there's something unusual about Jesus and he dares to admit to risk that. He dares to risk that this encounter could be different. So Jesus knows Zacchaeus has exploited his power and hurt people badly. He knows that Zacchaeus has been creating suffering, anger, hurt, and that most people hate him. Jesus is also clear that his mission is to those who are lost and that he is to free the captives. He has the intent of freeing Zacchaeus from the captivity of being lost in greed. In Jesus's words, and this was at the beginning of his ministry, the son of man came to look for and save people who were lost. Jesus wasn't interested in winning arguments about religion. He wanted people's hearts to change. On his end, we imagine Zacchaeus felt loved and accepted. Given his despised tax collector status, this was something he desperately needed. Conversion is Jesus's goal. His objective is that the extortionist in Zacchaeus dies and that Zacchaeus turns away from the devastation he's inflicting on his neighbors and the community. Jesus envisions Zacchaeus abandoning the cheating and fraud that had made him a rich man. He believes that Zacchaeus could become a new person. Healing wounds he has created by becoming generous to the poor and returning wealth to those he has impoverished. Jesus understands that he's called to love people like Zacchaeus and in loving him wants a very different life for him to be saved. In the light of God, Zacchaeus that has been struggling to survive is suddenly revived. A sliver of the kingdom of God will start to sparkle through him. Justice, healing, reconciliation, hope, love, community, and joy starts to break out around Zacchaeus. He starts to make reparations and shares his ill-gotten wealth. In every place that Zacchaeus spreads his material wealth, God's kingdom of peace and love will flourish. In today's language, Zacchaeus would be dispersing reparations. He would be repairing the breach he had, he had created. This action is not just returning money to the rightful owners. It's repairing the broken lives and the devastation he had inflicted on the community. The community is being restored. Of course, this also allows the rupture in his primary relationship with God to be restored, to be repaired, to be renewed. So Jesus is fulfilling his mission statement. We remember that at the beginning of Jesus's ministry, when he's in the church, uh, in the synagogue, he says that he is, and he reads the scripture from Isaiah, he says that he has come to free the captives. In this encounter, in this encounter, he is freeing Zacchaeus 
from an internal captivity of greed. From it, freeing him from his hardened heart and his destructive life. Zacchaeus is becoming free from the captivity of evil. The people he is returning the money to are being freed from the captivity of at least some of their poverty and are being freed of their hatred of Zacchaeus. So this is a wonderful conversion story. Zacchaeus went through a stunning transformation of behavior. He was no longer a person who cheated others out of their livelihood. Money was no longer his God. His God changed from being money to the God that we know. He no longer disseminated discord, poverty, and hate. A miracle had blossomed. Zacchaeus had amazingly been transformed into a person sowing justice, reconciliation, peace, and God's love. The reign of God that Jesus consistently taught about was starting to break out all around Zacchaeus. That salvation was open to those people committing terrible crimes in India and Congo. God sent Jesus to save us from those kinds of crimes and from the greed that motivated those crimes. God knows that as human beings, we are capable of those crimes and also crimes that are not as huge or dramatic. But being vulnerable to participating into those kinds of crimes is a part of our human condition. There are many passages in the Bible about money, wealth, and possessions. Many seem impossible to live. God knows that we are extremely vulnerable to the temptation of money. Much of our world is rooted in greed and crimes related to greed. If you watch for it, you'll see it. Watch. Watch the news and think about what is motivating people. Where is money and what is happening? We can't define salvation completely, certainly not in one worship service, but a large part of salvation is being saved from doing terrible things out of being captive of our desire for money. Zacchaeus got free of that captivity. He moved from love of wealth to love of God. Jesus celebrates in saying, today salvation has come to this house. And we're grateful that he also comes to our houses. Amen. Amen. I think that it, this time we have prayers. Um, we actually have a hymn first. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Jesus, I have decided.
So I invite your prayers. Prayers. Prayers in whatever you like, people that you know, for our world, for the church. So I invite your prayers. I pray for Trish. Thank you. And, and I'm a little bit lost because we used to have a response and I'm, I don't know whether you do that or not do that. Or what a, what, gracious, and who says that? Who says that? At the end of a prayer that's spoken, they should say, gracious God, and we were all say, hear our prayer. Thank you. All right. So we're going to say, gracious God, together. Great. Thank you. Yes. Communion prayer for our daughter in law Sandy, who is in Wentworth Douglas and we are struggling for her life. Gracious God, God hear our prayers. I'd offer prayers of courage to a group within the UCC that I know is dreaming of a not five for five offering, but six for six, and the six to be one of reparations for our own country. Gracious God. Hear our prayers. Yes. Uh, prayers of healing for a neighbor who has suffered some severe brain trauma. She's healing now, but she really needs all our prayers and encouragement. She's starting to walk with a walker. And uh, she's having trouble, but she's doing it. Gracious God, hear yeah. our prayers. I'd like to offer the prayers um, for Diwali, who is one of our students in Ghana. She recently went through very serious um, surgery, and she is recovering at home and doing well. So thank you, God, for that. Yeah. Hear our prayers. Thank you. Yes. Hear our prayers. Thank you. Yes. I'd like to say a prayer for the women of Iran who are fighting the fight that many of us are fighting here for women, women's rights. Add prayer of celebration for Christopher and Nicole's marriage and happy wedding. Gracious God, yeah. Yeah. Yes, David. I'd like to offer a prayer of thanksgiving to the West and the Lowly. And the Christensen's for welcoming us into their homes for a for breakfast dinner last night, which was delicious at every stop and a wonderful community at every stop and very what welcoming home at every stop. Hear our prayer. Great. Yes. Yeah, oftentimes we live isolated lives and insulated lives, and uh, we forget about our neighbors. Uh, our friends in Ghana are going through a very, very difficult time now. Inflation is worse in Ghana than it is in any other country in the world. Uh, the value of their, their currency has fallen, and Piling on what you said, Greg, decisions that are made far from Ghana are affecting the lives of our brothers and sisters, the ones that uh, we honor in our church, in relationships and in pictures. Uh, desperate situation for hunger. And uh, there are brothers and sisters. Yes. Gracious God. Here I pray. Others. 
Well, let's see, I'll, I'll offer one of thanks. Um, maybe probably all of us have been in difficult relationships at times that we didn't, you know, that we were pulling out our hair about. And so I've been in that recently and, and it's getting better. And uh, so I'm thankful for that. Yes. Thank you. All right. Let, uh, let's see. I'll, I'm going to lead us in prayer, um, but I also want to say something about um, our the Lord's Prayer that we have today. Um, and there's a little introduction to the Lord's Prayer that I will do, but it's a different kind of prayer. This prayer comes from the Maori people of the South Pacific. And so it's a different, it's a different uh, wording that I found helpful and I hope that you will. So let us pray. Thank you for all of these prayers that are offered, all of these good thoughts, these prayers, these wishes, these hopes, um, we're grateful for the good hearts that remember them and pray these prayers. And we pray your blessings on these situations that people have named. Someone named, named the Ukraine. It's like this is a terrible situation and it's not only that people are suffering terribly, which they are, but that is a danger to us all in this, in, if this war were to ever expand. Um, people are using this word of using nuclear weapons, which is disastrous. And so we pray for the situation for the people who are suffering in, in it now, but also that you save us from save us from disaster or the expanding. And these other people, Ghana has been mentioned, other people of the world are in Ghana and other places too, are suffering related to food, related to land, related to, related to uh, global warming, related to losing their houses, and so we pray, for, we pray for these people and we pray that you give us the wisdom to know what is our part in, in, in relieving that. We can't, we can't do it all. We shouldn't try to do it all. But we pray for knowledge about what is our role in these desperate situations. So we pray also for this church. We're grateful for this church in Barnstead. We're grateful for what it's been over the years. Pray your blessings on it. Pray your blessings on these good people who are, who are following in the ways that they know and that you guide them and strengthen them. So we begin with the Lord's Prayer. And I'll, I will make an introduction and then we will, we will pray together. Where we have struggled this week, you have been our patience and strength. Where we have grieved this week, you have been our solace and support. Where we have missed the mark, you have been our mercy and our peace. So it is that we are grateful and bold to pray. Earth maker, life giver, pain bearer, source of all that is and all that shall be, father and mother of us all, loving God in whom is heaven, may the hallowing of your name echo through the universe. May your heavenly will be done by all creatures, great and small. 
May your commonwealth of peace and freedom sustain our hope and come on earth. With the bread we need this day, feed us. For the hurt we inflict on one another, forgive us. By your grace and mercy, strengthen us through times of temptation. Spare us from trials too great to endure. Free us from bigotry and evil, for service and truth. We reign in the glory of the power that is love. Um, and we come to this time, we come to this time of our morning offering. But this is, this is the way, this is just as Zacchaeus, just as Zacchaeus conversion came through the giving of money, a returning of money, that we also are changed as we give that we come closer to God, that we, in giving our money, that we value it less and we value God more. So we have our morning offering. me our prayer of dedication. We pray that these gifts will become agents of transformation and healing in your world, and that in making these gifts, we become changed into a likeness closer to Jesus. Never alone Waking, sleeping I am with you You are my own In my love's baptismal river I have made you mine forever Go, my children, with my blessing
to you as you identify the values of your culture that are not the values of our faith. Power to you as you take steps in extricating yourself from whatever is false and embracing more fully the teachings and life of Jesus. God's strength, power, and blessing in your journey toward, you, toward your God. Amen. We thank today uh, worship reader Ralph White, a stewardship moment by Phil Ginta, guest minister Reverend Gray Fitzgerald, some graphic design and production by Emily. I don't say me, yes, sorry, Ann. <laughs> I just usually chuckle after I say my name. Um, then we have meditation Tuesday and Thursday. Is that right? Just Tuesday. Only Tuesday. That's what I thought too. So I was confused when I saw that. We just have Tuesday evening meditation at 5 p.m. Uh, Bible study, I believe, is coming back. Yes, indeed. Yep, this Wednesday at 10 30 with Charlie. Um, and Saturday, we have our pumpkin and pine fair from 9 to 2 here at the church. Um, I. Let's see, Rebecca will be back for service on Sunday. And all this week, people are welcome to stop by the church, come in. There should be instructions on what can be done, what you can be doing to help out. So you're welcome to come by all during the week. And uh, as we see here, the setup right after church today and come by any day this week to help um, with the setup efforts, and uh, we would love to have um, everybody volunteer for whatever time you can, whether you can come for the first shift from 8.30 to noon, or from noon to 2.30, or all day. Um, so we are looking. Uh, I also have 12 yard signs that are double printed that need to be distributed out on the roads, on the corners, as you come so if we could have a couple of volunteers that are willing to take them in the Alton direction in the Barnstead direction um, and put them up I have 12 of them here we may have some more hanging out um, but I have 12 brand new yard signs in the middle um, just make note of where you put them because if you're going to be the one to put them back out we'd like you to pick them up then too so they can go out today they say Saturday so it will help everybody get here on Saturday. Any other announcements? I can pass the microphone, passing it back to Barb, or maybe Ralph and then Barb. Uh, this is an announcement for the uh, search committee. We have been meeting a number of times. We were uh, scheduled to meet the first and third Tuesdays of each month at three in the afternoon. Um, our, our first big project is putting together a fairly elaborate profile of the church, more elaborate than the one we used for Rebecca. And we've been talking about some questions that are on that profile, and we would like to solicit um, responses from other people outside the committee to respond to some of these questions. Um, a question, I've put, we put together a questionnaire, which is just questions that are on the uh, format for the profile, which I, I send as a PDF to uh, Emily, and she's going to make it uh, a link so you can get them. I didn't want to print out a whole lot of hard copies uh, unless you really want to. Uh, uh, I didn't want people just to take them and, and not answer them. So uh, you can get to the link. I, if you can't do that, talk to me and I'll, I'll get a hard copy to you. Uh, for the next two weeks, we're going to be collecting them. I will bring this box in next Sunday. It's got a slot you can use to put in uh, your uh, answers to the questionnaire. Uh, it's only going to be up there for two weeks because we want to move forward on this. And uh, there's a lot of work still to be done. Um, so uh, please, 
uh, access the questionnaire and get it back because we would really like more opinions than um, just the ones of, of the five members of the search committee. And some of them are questions you're gonna have to think about and be honest because when we go looking for a minister, a new minister, we want that minister to know who we really are, not who we wish we were. The second Sunday in November, you want to back? Uh, in the next two Sundays, yep. either of the next two Sundays, the five, the second Sunday in November. Yep. Okay. Okay, I have two announcements. One of them is for stewardship. If you haven't brought in your card yet with your donation for the church, um, please bring it in next week. And you can put it in the donut in a donation plate. If you did not receive a card to fill out, I have extras up front. Um, the second one is basically about the big table for the fair. I'm in charge of the big table this year. If anyone's going to be making breads, I have these. If you're making pies, I have pie plates. I also have boxes for the pies. And if you're making cookies or something smaller, um, I have these boxes. I'm trying to stay away from plastic wrap and all that other stuff. Charlie, so, oh, there you go. I got a whole bunch for you, John. I actually ended up buying four times what I wanted because when I ordered through Amazon, it said, sorry, something happened on our end, try again. So I did four times and I got four different deliveries of everything. So we're all set for the next four years from there. So but if you haven't signed up to bake anything, please go up on the book and just sign it for me so I know it's coming in. Um, this will be my hell week for baking for me because I do a lot of baking for the church. So um, anyway. So that's it for me. Thank you. I, I, I guess I have two announcements. I was just putting some of those deadlines into my calendar, and I realized next Sunday is they like giving time ends or whatever they call it. Mm -hmm. So we're going to turn the clock back. So, well, yeah, but whether or not we get an extra hour, I'm just concerned that it's going to be too early or too late for church, however that works out. So I'm just reminding folks. And I guess the other thing I would say in relation to Gray's great sermon today, um, we have another Sunday before November 8th, but November 8th is one opportunity for us to um, think about how complicit we are in, in the world of money and greed and, uh, and freedoms and rights and all of that. So I would make sure everybody has a plan to vote. And if you need any information, there's lots of good information out there. If you want help, Anyway, I, I just leave it there because I know I'm not supposed to talk about politics in church. So anyway, November 8th is an important day for all of us. So. Oh, well, good morning. I feel like I need to do the uh, rallying cry. We're pumping in the pine. Woo, we're here again. <laughs> So um, we're going to, uh, I don't know how you all have done it before uh, setting up for this, but I'm hoping that we're going to get the table set up today and the covers on them and designating what tables are what. And then I will be here for the remainder of the day unpacking everything that's there. And we'll get that all done so that we can see what we have, how we might want to package it or form it. Um, and then I will be here again. I will be here other times, but I will be here for sure on Wednesday and Friday from 10 to 2. And I'll be working and pricing and doing different things in that. Um, you all are going to be here whenever you want to be, but yeah. I want to see what we've got today. I want to see what else is coming in and then work on also what I'm bringing in. Because I can, you know, with that. So um, anything else that you ladies want to add to this? Um, you're busy, very busy, and um, yeah, just I see Emily for the sign. Um, and I think that that's good. And, and, sh and share all that information on your social media pages because we need buyers, we need people to come and talk. Yes, one thing do we have enough people to man the tables? Because you know, I think so, set up with five tables, just the whole set. 
Well, um, I think that we have enough people within this church to man the yeah. tables. Yeah. yeah. I think we'll be good. And we have um we have a Pat Johnson who she is she 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 oh she is okay so she'll be here at some point today. Um she has a pop-up, um, we have a pop-up, and then Amy has a pop-up, yes. <laughs> A, 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 a huge tent. A huge tent. Okay. It's so big. Um, so I'm thinking that's like a double wide, like a 10 by 20. Oh, 10 by 40. Okay. Well, maybe we, I, so we need a few people to set that up. No, my daughter and my husband are going to do it. They are. The morning of. The morning of. Yeah. The morning of. Yeah, the morning of. The wind and all. Really do you? Okay. Do you have weight for the corner of the house? It has um, it's it on the ground, and we have these couple of tables to go with it, and some chairs. Okay, I, I have weights. If, yeah. It does help to weigh the. Put it stand down. down. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's perfect. just perfect. And if you have some extras, I have a very close to full. Yeah. When they had mm -hmm. an outdoor festival, it, oh, they, made, yeah. it, so they made new regulations that they all all the tents had to be sandbagged. Okay, so, good. Um, you know, a storm comes through, and all of a sudden they're being picked up. And I think start bringing them here. Um, we are going to have uh, hamburgers and hot dogs. I think is yeah. that is that right? Hold that. Yeah, 